I can get. That's right. I'm going back at that one, let me tell you. If the wind starts blowing, I might need you. I, I'm right there. All right. Can y'all see that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's glossy, you know. Some of these might be glare. No, I might. I might have an easy topic, really. Forages. Isn't that a plus? A, this is a good year to talk about forage. We all have forage, right? We've got grass. If we don't have grass this year, we really need to look at our our pasture program, right? Because I mean, it's we've just been blessed with a lot of rain and good weather. And I mean. How cool is it right here in August, you know, to have a field day? We're all comfortable sitting here. So it's been a good year. It's been a great year. Uh, probably one of the nicest summers I think I've had since I've been in Kentucky. So uh, so we, we're lucky to have that. Now, obviously things change. You know, the weather's always changing, and we don't, we don't know what's coming up. But, uh, you know, I think what we, we've got two things I think we're really blessed with, having cattle and having forage. Our cow prices are high. I had a great CP8 sale last night in Owensboro. Uh, so our cattle prices are high. We've got lots of forage, lots of feed out there for this time of the year. So those are two good things. And I guess what, what it always helps to do, not only count our blessings, but maybe, okay, step back and say, okay, what am I going to do to try to keep this thing going or to utilize these two factors to the best of our ability, right? Uh, you know, we don't have to be very good grazing managers this year to keep our cattle in grass, right? We don't have to get very creative this time of the year, this year like we normally do this time of the year, right? So I think it always helps to kind of go back and review and go back to the basics and, and, and kind of, you know, see where are we at. We're in late summer. The rain may stop. You know, we may have a dry September and October, and we may not get to stockpile a whole lot of grass. Uh, but if we start doing some management practices now, even if we don't go out and put a lot of nitrogen fertilizer out necessarily, we may can just defer some grazing and maybe let some field start start stockpiling, right? Maybe do that late summer mowing that that uh, Dr. Green was talking about and then get off a of pasture or two and, and take advantage of some surplus grass we have in other fields and rotate and take, some, take a field or two out of out of the rotation. This might be a good year to do that. What I would do, if you're going to look at renovating anything or targeting any particular part of your field, or if you haven't done it in several years, I would encourage you to go out and soil test the whole farm if you hadn't done it in a, in a while. I like to concentrate, personally, I like to concentrate on a third of my ground a year, okay, and kind of keep that in rotation and adjust my P and K and my pH on a third of my ground and, and, and go to the next third the next year and so on and target concentrate on one third to maybe clean up get the fertility right and set the table to plant clover that next February right and, and just kind of have a system in mind whatever system works for you with your PK and lime if you get in a habit of putting that fertilizer out say first of September late August first of September maybe by mid-September at the latest even if you want, don't want to take a chance on 50 units or 80 units of nitrogen, by adjusting your P and K, you may get 20, 30 units of, of, uh, of, of nitrogen with the DAP fertilizer, right? So getting in a habit of some fall fertilization with our P and our K on at least portions of our, our ground can kind of be a good habit to get into and set the table for getting our fertility up and, and kind of kind of sprucing up at least part of our acreage, right? So take some of that, maybe it's a good time to take some of that money we're getting on these calves, put a little bit back into that soil, right? This is another good time to inventory our hay. And I can't believe as much as I'm a nut about, about testing hay, I didn't put, we need to test our hay, right? We need to test our hay. A lot of us don't do that, okay? And then some of us, you know, we're good in extension about preaching, test your hay, test your hay, and then we don't necessarily help you do anything with that hay test, right? Now, we've got an app now that can at least get you started when you get your hay test back that you can download on the, on a smartphone uh, that we came up with about two years ago. It's called the UK Beef Cow Forage Supplement Tool. And that's a long title, but our IT folks, put it in a long title with a bunch of names to where Google searches or whatever search engine you want 
when you do a search, it'll grab some of those various labels, and you'll get a you you can uh, and you can find it. If any y'all got your smartphone out right now? Do a, do a search for UK Beef Cow Forage Supplement Tool, and it should be in the first you know one or two hits there on the list there, right? You can download that app on your smartphone. You can get your hay test, and with four ingredients: your moisture, your protein. Your TDN, which is your energy content, and your NDF, which is your neutral detergent fiber, which kind of gives us a kind of a gross estimate of how that cow, how much that cow is going to actually eat of that hay. Okay, not super accurate, but it gives us an idea of what that cow is going to actually be able to consume on a daily basis. That neutral detergent fiber. You plug those four, those four uh, factors in off your hay test, and you can, and then you can choose. A mid-gestating cow, a late gestation cow, or a cow that's lactating, so your three stages of production, and it'll tell you right away how much supplement you need, whether you need an energy supplement like soy hull, whether you need a protein supplement like distillers. So just as, as easy as that, you can get an idea of where you're at on your on your hay quality and what you're gonna need depending on you know what stage of production your cows are in, right? So I really encourage you to get that out, test your hay. And at least kind of see where you're at. Now, if you want to have a full-blown ration where you're going to pull in different forage sources, maybe some silage, some hay, haylage, whatever, and you're going to get a little more elaborate, or if you're going to feed calves, you're going to need to go to a ration balancing program. Now, we've got a ration balancing program, UK does, that we don't distribute, okay? But our county agents have access to it. We can run rations for you, so if you want... A ration run you can contact Carrie. Carrie can I think she's getting pretty comfortable with it and then our between both of us we can get your rations made. If you want to do some of that on your own there are two very user-friendly rations programs that are free. Oklahoma State has one called Calculator okay Calculator do a Google search for it it's free and it'll it does a real good simple job of cow ration all right University of Georgia has one, I forget the name of theirs, but you can just type the University of Georgia ration balancer. It's got one that can also do calf rations, okay? Uh, and then again, so there's some, there's two, and it's pretty user friendly to use too. So, whatever you do, figure out how much hay you have, do you have enough, we've got time to make adjustments now. Good news is hay should be relatively cheap, plentiful. I would encourage you, if you don't have enough hay, get some bought now and don't wait, but this is a good hay year. Get it tested and get a plan. Get a plan for the for the, for the the upcoming uh, winter, fall and winter. We talked about setting aside some grazing. Even if you're not a big stockpiling fanatic like I am, I'm all about stockpiling fescue, okay? Uh, even if you really don't do a whole lot of that, use this year and all this surplus forage maybe, again, to set aside a field that you're just not gonna touch until maybe calving. Maybe just keep a good, clean, fresh field that you would be comfortable putting pears in or calving in. And uh, and don't leave the gates all open as we get into October, November, and let everything get grazed down and then start feeding hay like we normally do. Just, just challenge your thinking just a little bit and try to save five acres, 10 acres, whatever, because that fescue's quality is not gonna go down a whole lot. And it's probably gonna be better quality than the hay that you put up. And it would be a good, clean place, long about February or March, to roll some fresh pears to or to actually uh, go ahead and calve some cows. Maybe get them away from the hay rings a little bit. Won't have to supplement them much there. And, uh, and, and, and kind of get a clean environment for these calves, right? So think about that. This would be a good year maybe to get that done. If you're going to do any major renovations, like getting some pastures reseeded, September 15th is kind of the magic date. You can go past that a little bit, but think about, have that in your mind to, to motivate you there. September 15th, if you're going to be reseeding some perennial pastures, get that done. If you're going to do anything with annuals, small grains, or ryegrass, or anything like that, you know, right now, you can start now, okay? Uh, if you start now and you get an early stand of any of your small grains, just realize you may be a little vulnerable to army worms. You know, uh, if, you, if you plant early, but if you plant early and you get the rain, we got the moisture. You can get it up. We can keep getting moisture. You may may be a chance where you can get some fall grazing, some significant fall grazing if you plant it early. Okay. So 
So just some things to think about kind of this year uh, right in front of us. Now, here's some kind of some thinking outside the box, if you let me use that cliche there, you know, some things to, <clears throat> to maybe challenge your, your thinking a little bit. You may think I'm crazy when we go through this, but that's fine. How about with this, with all this forage we have, okay, <coughs> and the hay barns are full, I'm assuming, how about this being a year that you actually try something a little bit different? Let's say a spring calving scenario. So we've got some spring calves, pairs on the ground. We Let's say we're going to wean them in middle of September, 1st of October, and uh, get them ready for the CPH sale there in Owensboro Bend, okay, which we like to encourage folks to do. Regardless of how you sell your calves, say maybe the middle of September, we're getting this moisture, we still got good conditions. How about if you put those cows, those dry cows, after weaning, either into a dry lot or into the field that has the worst fertility. Maybe the field that has the worst weed pressure that you really need to deal with here in the next year or so. Or one that's just, again, like low fertility. And then let's, let's, let's maybe feed some hay for about 60 days. Let's feed hay October, November. Let the, let the ground, let the, the rest of the field, the rest, the rest of the farm stockpile. Okay? And because, and the reason I'm saying this, most of the hay we put up will fit the will fit the needs of a cow in mid gestation. Okay, mid gestation. Most of this roll hay will fit it without any supplement. Okay, so you can stockpile your ground, and then as we get closer to December and we're getting closer to calving time, maybe go ahead and start grazing some of that stockpile feed. It might get us through February. We did a trial in 06 and 07, the winter of 06, 07, uh, down in Gracie. And it was dumb luck the year we picked to do this. We had a good fall stockpiling season. Lots of rain, lots of good stockpile grass. We weaned the calves September 15th. We ran on corn stalks for about two weeks. And then that the, the tenant who farmed that ground came in and planted wheat. So we had to get off the corn stalks. Brought the cows into a dry lot. He chose to do it in a dry lot. And we fed those cows for about 70 days. The hay at that time tested 10% protein, 51% TDN. So it more than met the needs of a, of a dry cow requirement. The end of December, we started grazing our stockpile grass. We grazed those cows all the way to spring grass in April. We strip grazed those cows. We never fed any more hay after that 70 day period. Okay? <clears throat> so we were able, and now every year is not that, that you know, that that good, okay? Obviously, years there's different weather patterns. But what was unique about the 06, 07 year is what happened in the spring of 07? Anybody remember the spring of 07? Around Easter time? What happened to East, at Easter of 2007? If you had grass, if you had cattle, you're going to remember the spring of what happened on Easter. Froze. Froze. We had, that, we had the Easter freeze. We had our clover was up, our spring grass was coming, I think it was the first week in April, and we had that three-day freeze and took out all the clover. I think it killed alfalfa stands. And, and I mean, then what happened the summer of 07, right after that? We had a drought. The first significant drought, I, I moved to Kentucky in 91, it was the first significant drought I ever experienced since I've been in Kentucky. Now, I think 2012 was worse. I still have nightmares of 2012, but, but the 07 drought was the first significant drought we had. That particular individual we did this project in where we fed the hay first and grazed the cows second, okay? He started calving the middle to the end of January, and he finished calving in March. He was able to graze right into right into April grass. That particular individual had two of the commodity hay barns, right? Kind of like his feed barn we have over here, about that size. He put put two of those barns up in hay every year. Every year he pretty much fed two barns worth of hay. By doing this strategic winter feeding, we called it, he only fed one barn full of hay because those dry cows eat less. They were wasting less because they were in a dry light and it was dry condition. All right and we were able to graze more, he had a whole barn full of hay that he could 
use in that summer at 07 drought. And he was not scrambling like so many other folks were, either getting out of state hay that was overpriced, that had all the freight attached to it, or remember we were cutting CRP ground and everything else. I mean, we were desperate, you know. So it was just lucky that was the timing of that. Now that particular producer has been doing some variation of this feed the hay first, stockpile the, the, the and graze second, uh, practice some variation of it since. Now, obviously, in 2012, we had a tough time getting a hay crop, but 2012, we got moisture in the fall. So every year, we, we will get some degree of stockpile grass if we manage for it. How much we'll get will obviously vary from year to year. So uh, just, just think about that a little bit. We're doing a trial, starting a little trial or a little demo in Caldwell County um, this fall with a, fall, a set of fall cabin cows. And when that particular case, about half the farm is orchard grass and the other half is, is fescue. What we're going to do on that case, we're going to calve those cows. They're going to start calving here in the next two weeks. We're going to calve those cows in a good shady paddock that doesn't have any hazards, sinkholes and whatnot, that's close to a pen, so a good place to calve them. We're going to calve them on hay in the shady pasture, and as they calve, we're going to move those pairs to our orchard grass field. Now he has developed his two orchard grass blocks. He's got two 30 acre blocks and we've got a, a tire tank in the middle of both those blocks so he can cut each of those into, uh, he's got each of those into four paddocks. So we're going to have eight paddocks total of orchard grass to rotate through. Okay? So we're going to move pairs into there and rotate through those, alright, as our cows become wet. And then after we move off the orchard grass, it'll play out, say, in November, we're going to move over to the stockpile fescue and try to get as, as far into the winter as we can on it. Now, in that scenario, we're not going to get through the whole winter, probably. Okay, we're probably going to get to the, maybe, I'm, we're hoping the end of February to where we're only having to do a lot of hay feeding there in March. Okay, so we're going to kind of look at this thing from a fall cabin standpoint and see what we can do, kind of, kind of altering the order of things there. So... Another thing we're going to work on, I'm working with another producer down, and I'll show you a picture here in a minute, trying to utilize some crop ground. We've got a lot of crop farmers that are looking at cattle again, even though they bulldoze the fences down in our part of the country. You know, now they're putting some fences up or trying to get a hold of some, some ground that they can uh, put cattle on. So we're looking, there's some interest in utilizing some crop ground. <clears throat> with that, of course, comes concerns about compaction and whatnot. We're starting a little, uh, a little demo there in South Christian County and looking at we're going to be taking some compaction readings at corn harvest. We're going to plant some annuals on some of that ground, graze it at least this fall, and then take compaction readings throughout the winter. You know, in Iowa and Nebraska has got some really good data on compaction on crop ground. Cattle will compact crop ground when we use it and graze it, right? But what, what happens up north is you can read and get compacted soil readings in the fall, midwinter. By springtime, planting time, we've had enough freezing and thawing that the compaction is not doesn't exist anymore. So Mother Nature has kind of alleviated it. What we don't have good data on is good more southern data in our neck of the woods. So we're in, in maybe our soil types I'm sure are different. So we're going to look at some of that and maybe have something to report on that, you know, uh, at least, you know, at least from that standpoint. But I think we've got a lot of crop ground. Oh, most of it's not fenced and has water, but, you know, there's a lot of crop ground out there that might, with a little bit of development, can be used, right? Let me show you all a picture, and this is a, a picture of it, and I'll get back to the last part of this. Here is, the, is one field that we're also doing another project on that same farm in, in uh, Christian County. He's put a tire tank in the middle of this 40 acre field. This year we did sorghum Sudan hit and it just, it was so unruly to deal with. Got away from us. We had to cut it and roll a lot of it for hay which cured up horribly, okay? Which you can only imagine it's tall as this tent here, you know? <clears throat> so what we are doing, learning some lessons, we got the tire tank here what we're going to do next year is we're going to set the table, we're going to plant a winter annual this fall, but next spring we're going to put in corn. 
this is 28 acres here kind of in this L shape here, right? This is 28 acres. This is a sacrifice fescue area here. <clears throat> what our object here is to do, Tim Taylor, who's here today, has done all, we've done some, some demos and he's continued <laughs> to do uh, some work with grazing green corn with stalker calves. We've done some of that at UK and have done, had really good results and got good gains. What we're going to try here on this Christian County farm next year is we're going to try to graze green corn with cows. He's got 200 cows and he's got 100 calf in the spring, 100 calf in the fall. And he's also a crop farmer. So what we're going to do is he's going to try to plant three maturities of corn to try to space this out. I guess, Tim, the best we can do just planting it all in once and strip grazing is about six weeks of grazing. And we're going to try to push that a little longer, see if we can get about two months of grazing by staggering our maturities on our corn. And I've learned a lot just watching Tim and what he's done. But we're going to try to kind of tailor it more toward a cow-calf situation and maybe have it to where the calves can go out into the corn ahead of the cows and sort of creep graze ahead of the cows and let our cows kind of clean up this mess behind them. Okay, we can stretch that to two months. If we can get our cows, say, from about the middle of July to the middle of September on 28 acres, we're going to try to do this with 100 pairs. And if you do the math, it, it potentially can work. 100 pairs could potentially work. If we do this, strip grazing this off, think about what it's doing for our fields in that July to September period during our summer slump, right? It's, it should help this fescue, our cool season grasses rest, recover, get ready, set the table to either graze in the fall or stockpile in the fall. So that's the thinking behind it. Now, it's going to be kind of expensive to put in, but we're not putting in a sure enough corn crop. We're going to, we're going to plant, the population's going to be high, but we're not going to push it real hard with nitrogen. What do you usually do about 60 units of nitrogen on your corn that you graze? So you're not pushing high rates of nitrogen. <coughs> The reason we like this corn is we get a lot of tonnage, okay, and we don't have all the ills that come with stuff like sorghum sudan or sudan grass in terms of having to rely on regrowth and worrying about whether it's going to turn off dry and then we're going to get into nitrate troubles or maybe get into prussic acid if we get some kind of damage or stunted, you know, drought conditions or whatever. So the green corn grazing is just, a, we think it's a little safer, easier kind of thing to do. So uh, we're going to try to run the numbers and see see if that if that'll work. So that's just something something that we're we're looking at. Last thing that kind of hit that I kind of want to emphasize, I guess, two things quickly. We're we're making some cattle profits right now, right? It's been some good years. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you all how to spend your your cattle profits, right? It's none of my business. But if you are looking at things and, and wanting suggestions, think of things that might can help you as we go down on the other side of the cycle. You know, cattle prices aren't always going to be high. We're not always going to have a great summer like we just had. The biggest thing I think you could put some, some money into an investment, and you can probably get some cost share help through NRCS, is developing your water sources. If you can develop water and get stock water in every one of your fields, that would do just wonders on how you can manage your grass, manage your pastures, do a lot of the things that, that J.D. was talking about that will help you. You know, we're always going to have some weed issues, but it might help you uh, work around some of these weed issues or keep some at bay from a management standpoint. You know, and it'll help you build fertility. It'll help you build fertility over time. But there's the field day I asked you about, the gentleman down in that Tennessee, Kentucky line there uh, that Dr. Arnold's been going to, uh, and I hope to go this year, has what, hadn't fertilized his pastures in what? At least five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. Buys his hay in, okay, does a good job of rotational grazing, okay, probably a little more intense than, than most of us, but buys hay in and looks at it as bringing nutrients, net nutrients to the farm, okay, and has eliminated a lot of his fertilizer bill. So, I mean, things, there's some, I think we, there's a lot of, lot of improvement, a lot of things we can exploit with, with pasture maintenance, I mean, pasture management and whatnot. The last thing, and then I'll hush, is this <coughs> novel end of fight fescue. If you're looking <coughs> at putting a field, say, uh, if you've got a crop field you're going to put back in the grass, 
or, uh, or if you want to just consider, I'd like you to consider using one of our novel end of fight species, whether it be Max Q, the Bar Optima, what's, there's another one that's, there's three main ones, but uh, I'm starting to become more and more and more of a believer in these. My partner in, in the cattle that we have, we do one little truckload a year, it's just one truckload a year, but my partner's got 15 acres of Max Q that he put in in 07. And we put our, when we bring in, we'll buy 70, 75 calves. Once we, and I'll winter them on my farm, okay, that I rent, and it's just regular old Kentucky 31 dirty fescue, right? And I'll winter them, and i punish that grass, go through, and we get them through the winter. Long about the end of February, the beginning of March, nothing's been on his ground. We'll sort out a, a gooseneck load out of that group to go to his farm to start the, the summer process. Every year, we bring the smallest, naughtiest, fluffiest, <laughs> chronic looking calves out of the group. As long as they're calm, we bring them to his farm. And without a doubt, they'll catch up to our calves, to, to the calves on, on my renting ground. This stuff is real. This stuff is real. Now, can we punish it and abuse it like we do Kentucky 31? I don't think we can. But I think that, that, you know, the jury's still out on some of these new varieties. We may can, can, can work it a little harder. But we've been basically grazing that February, March period through August at his place. And the set of calves this year, I'm, I'm real anxious to get them sold next week and see what that group of 17 we got at his farm this year and get them weighed up. Because I'll have a, an in weight and an out weight and we can compare, we can get a real gain on, on what those calves do compared to the gain of the whole group. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced we're getting three to four tenths at least boost by using these novel in the fight uh, species. So even if you don't want to go, and it, it takes a, it's a two year commitment to get it started, to do it right. You might can get a hay crop the first year, but it's going to be two and even three years. I know Dr. Lacefield said wait until your third year to start putting clover in it. But this is, uh, this is something that you may want to have as a project on just a portion of your ground to start with. And maybe be a place where you can bring your cows in that May and June period when you're trying to get them bred. You know, uh, some place to get cows bred on or some place to graze calves after you get them, get them weaned. So, uh, so you, you, we've got four specialists that can help you with this, talk, work you through some of this and how to actually get this done. And... Uh, so, I mean, all you got to do is call Kerry. We can get the get the information to you. So, any questions on any of this? All right.